The Agronomist is made possible by our show sponsors, Profitable Practices, The Sharp Edge, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hi, everyone. Yes, welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And thank you all for being so concerned about whether or not the water was over my head. Uh, Peter, yes, I am above water. Uh, But just barely, yes, it's true. We have had over at least 80 mils in the past probably two days. We were under a rainfall warning. Uh, There are lakes everywhere. There are ponds sitting on all the winter wheat peat. So sorry about that. Uh, And we've had to move animals out of water's way already. So absolutely wild, hoping it slows down. Uh, But pretty happy that those that needed some water uh, got some. And of course, it is warm out west and drying out. So please send that our way. Uh, wonderful to see everybody in the comments already. Of course, water, er, water, rain gets everybody talking. Uh, tonight, quick reminder before we get to the show, CU credits. Yes, if you collect them, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Let us know you watched the episode and you'll get those CEU credits. Tonight, we are going to talk early season weed control, tough to kill weeds, a little bit about spraying, and whatever else you want to talk about this early in the season. And joining me, I'm incredibly excited about tonight because we're going to have a lot of fun. Mike Cobra with Omafra out of Ontario and Tammy Jones with Corteva out of Manitoba. Welcome here. Yes, yeah, thanks for having us. All right. Okay. So, um, so exciting to see so many people already here. This is exciting. So everyone get your questions in um, for our team here. Let's start with um, where we're at as far as what is growing. All right. So here in Ontario, we had, and Manitoba got it too, this amazing run up in temp. We were a little further ahead uh, in we didn't have six feet of snow like Manitoba had to get rid of. Uh, so, you know, from where I sit, although most things are underwater, everything is very green. So, Mike, we'll start with you. What are we seeing for uh, most of the weed pressure right now where you are? Yeah, so I think largely what that week of warm weather did here was uh, any winter annuals or, or things that had emerged late last fall, they you know, they grow at low temperatures anyway, and a little bit of heat will, uh, you know, send them growing a little bit faster. So I haven't seen too much in the way of the typical summer annuals uh, up yet. Um, starting to see things like spreading atriplex uh, seedlings and stuff. But but by and large, the impact of that warm week of weather is it it probably advanced the stage of winter annual weeds uh, a little bit quicker than than we'd like. So the, the implications of that are for, for species like uh, bluegrass or some of those grassy weeds that we see competing in wheat, they're, they're probably at a more advanced stage on May 1st this year than they would be in, in other years. Now, Tammy, I've seen some pictures out of Manitoba. There is still snow in some areas. <laughs> Does that mean there's nothing in the field? Because I I've, have a feeling there's lots of stuff in the field. So I did send some pictures your way and slide three is an example that I think uh, is is pretty interesting. Uh, things are greening up, uh, browning up. I don't know what they're doing there. So definitely we're seeing the typical uh, weeds that we see at the time of year. So dandelion for like obvious that that's dandelion on the left uh, and American dragon head on the right, um, both in the perennial or biennial or somewhere type of life cycle. And so they're both out there. I thought it was really cool because when I looked at the field, man, it didn't look that green out there. And that's because you can see that some of these weeds are definitely not, um, not as green as what they will be. Um, so that, you know, uh, makes it important to go out in the field and look around to see what you've got. Um, of course, there's others as well. We've got lots of shepherd's purse and lots of stinkweed in in fact, I saw a stink that was almost blooming today. So mm-hmm. there may be snow in spots, but the weeds are the weeds are taking advantage of the moisture, not where it's in excess, but uh, all that, that. There's been a few warm days, nothing like what you guys have seen, and uh, we're yeah. still doing well. I think some disappointments. I didn't see any kochia yet. I'm 
I mean, it's coming, um, but uh, we need a few more. We need a few more warm days. So next week, I should hopefully start to see kochia germinating. Um, but definitely dandelion, American dragonhead, all the winter annuals, all the good stuff is, is out there, just like Mike was suggesting as well. So, is it Mike, because? I wanna... can... Sorry, is is it Sorry. because you're a weed specialist that you're disappointed? And not seeing the kosher yet or is it because you would yes. like to kill it and it needs to be there first yes okay um we don't have much seeding happening i don't know what it's like as far as seeding progress elsewhere i know that in saskatchewan there's a few spots and in alberta definitely a little bit further ahead in a couple of areas but in manitoba we haven't had a lot of seed go to the ground yet it's very cool. Uh, we did have five degrees Celsius for a little while earlier today. So it's, it is warming up, but um, so we can wait. We need it to green up a little bit more. Um, and then we can worry about some of those pre-seed herbicide applications. The thing that I was going to ask Mike with those brown weeds is how good would a herbicide be? How, mm. how well would it work on those brownish weeds? I, I feel like question. I'd want it to grow more days before I hit it hard and yep yep but just yeah I mean because neither of those really do well yeah mm. yeah 100 percent. I mean we see that uh, that same symptomology sometimes uh in winter wheat after UAN has been applied right you get some UAN burn that takes away enough leaves that you're you're hopeful that it'll kill it but ultimately uh, there's enough green that it'll regrow. And so that's always kind of a tenuous period when there's not much green uh, mm -hmm. tissue for uptake and active growth. And so if you can, if you can delay and let, let more kind of positive growth occur, then that's, that's, I, that's preferred, right? Uh, like if you're, if you're targeting brown tissue, the expectations would be pretty low for, for any good efficacy. And I, I think that, you know, just judging by some of the comments in the chat, like that's the challenge around like, you know, spraying herbicides in winter wheat in Ontario at this time of year, right? Uh, the, the weather is cool now. And so there's always a, a concern about crop injury. Um, and reality is the weeds aren't growing tremendously fast either. So, you know, you, you still can't afford to wait off. Um, until better conditions, which I think here, you know, if we look into next week, things will be more favorable. It's always a struggle, right? Uh, but um, especially now when when multiple things go in the tank, right? It's not just, a, if it was just a herbicide, I think you, we could probably manage that a bit better, maybe even be a, a bit more aggressive, but when you're mixing uh, other things like fungicides and maybe even a growth regulator, um, you know, it, it can increase the risk of injury, especially in stressful conditions. We will be talking more about that. Tammy, question from Peter Johnson. I'll let you answer it, but I have my guess. I don't take, they, they, I, I don't take check questions from Peter. Never. <laughs> You're gonna. Okay, uh, it's from a Mr. Johnston. Uh, was the tissue brown from cold temps or purple from cold soils and no root growth? To which I respond, yes. Um, in that I'm going to assume yes. it was both. But sure. Yeah. yeah. I think in this particular case, we know dandelion. Well, I could have tried digging those up. Their the roots are very fine under that dandelion, and I'm going to assume the same with the American dragonhead. I didn't dig it up. I apologize, Peter. Next time I will do a better job. Um, but I think the cooler temperatures are really where we're at. Uh, we just haven't seen a lot of active growth. I did mm -hmm. try to run through a few fields this weekend in preparation for this to see what else was out there, and it's really just those. Uh, uh, persistent winter annuals and perennials that are out there, uh, but not a lot else is growing right now. Um, mm -hmm. You don't see volunteer cereals. You don't see anything else out in the field. So uh, just too cold so far, but we're not seeding yet either. So, Well, I had hoped to kill all the dandelions in the field I'm trying to establish, but after 96 mils or whatever it was, it's going to be a while, guys. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that because... I don't know. Anyway, maybe I just I need a whole bunch of kids to go digging. I don't know. Like it's, I have no idea when we'll get on the fields here, guys. It's really is it, so specifically. What where where are your dandelions in? Is this a pasture situation? Like, so give me more information, Lindsay. Oh goodness. So it's um yeah. It was a, it was a hay field uh, that we took out because it 
was established in a drought <laughs> year, so never really got established well. And then we've been doing like annual forage, but not getting but every year the dandelions have just got worse and worse and so this year was supposed to be like reset cleanup and it was uh we had animals grazing it last fall because it was an annual forage and so then it was we were going to go in super early and burn everything down in the spring and then put in beans and clean it up and then go into fall rye and then establish it next year it was a great plan mike it was a super great plan and now it is a carpet of beautiful uh, dandelion, and I just got 96 millimeters of rain. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think Warren had some actionable items there in terms of uh, management, but um, <laughs> that aside, I love them. I, I mean, I only have three goats. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Honestly, though, like uh, the forage quality of dandelion is not poor. Like, if we want to wax positive. Um, yes. Usually the challenge with dandelion is more, it, it has a higher moisture content than desirable species. So if you're going for dry hay, it's just tougher to dry down. It's difficult to, to harvest all that good stuff, but it's not, yeah. it's not horrible in terms of forage quality. I'll set that aside because that's a poor sell. I realize that. <laughs> I, I would actually just, I, I, I'd, I'd circle back and focus on the fall. Like dandelion management yeah. in the fall will give you 20 to 30% better control than anything you can do in yeah. the spring. So I think you reset, you, you go forward in the fall, maybe save your energy this spring because it's, it's tough, especially in a forage crop to, to manage dandelions effectively. Yeah, it really is. Okay, I will take all of this under advisement. And yes, it is true. I have completely lost control of my program. We are mounting sprayers on goats. We are doing weed wicking with the wool. Of sheep the wickers. Sheep sheep wickers yeah so i i just want to tease a yes. little bit in a few weeks sometime in june i actually have a whole episode planned about um non herbicide weed control so things like zappers and um you know the harrington weed destroyer all these sorts of things seed destroyer and so i shall add this to my list of things okay so peter says what about the dreaded t word okay i'm gonna assume he means tillage and we are going to talk about that tonight. So, Peter, excellent segue. Tammy, of course, and anyone else from out west gets the sweats. Um, if you're in Saskatchewan, nobody wants to talk about tillage. But I do get, I'm a pro zero till person, of course. I love perennial cover as well. But I get people who always say, oh, well, weeds can't ever get resistant to iron. So I'm going to rely on iron. So let's go to this conversation. Mike how effective is tillage and we even have a clip for this but we're going to talk about it first yeah i mean just because i'm sometimes uh contrarian i mean i i actually take issue with that comment like there's tons of weeds that uh, resist tillage right uh, otherwise they would be 100 percent effective um yeah i think to me i always go back to what is your biggest yield threat and what's the tool needed to do that right and i think the reality is there's certain species that uh, require um, tillage to effectively manage them, that the soil like literally needs to be turned over. And so if that is your biggest threat, then that's the tool that's needed to do the job. Um, you know, that's kind of my position on tillage, like, uh, you know, the, the common tillage tools, I guess the most popular tillage tools, like the vertical tillage uh, tools aren't particularly good at perennial weed control um mm -hmm. their 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 function is more maybe on very small annuals um but you know if i think of some of the problems like uh the perennial sow thistle or again bluegrass species like those are things that that require a mold board plow um to to manage them uh, quite frankly and i mean the good news is that like there's a, a study done recently um, that looked at the energy, energy consumption of different methods of weed control and tillage tools rank pretty low in terms of, of energy consumption compared to, you know, things like zapping weeds and steaming weeds and, and, and things of that nature. So I don't know. I, I think the reality is we have herbicide resistant weed issues. Uh, we talk about multiple modes of action all the time we need to use tillage uh, on the weeds that have the biggest the greatest threat to yield so we actually have a, a clip or sorry a visual of that energy i'm yes which one yeah, is it of yours good. yeah um 
And then yes, uh, while Jay is finding that, yeah. it's slide four, Tammy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got Jason says, oh, yeah, Tammy knows all about wild oats and tillage. So tell me the story of trying sure. trying to get a hold of wild oats and then you have tillage while we and then we can go back to this. But yeah, tell me what it doesn't work for. Well, I'm somewhat terrified to talk to tillage because I said John Hurd is also monitoring here. So I see that um, he's retired I, I now, though. So he yeah. can't do anything about it. Oh, so he, he can't haunt me anymore? That would be great. <laughs> um, I mean, there are certain weeds that I agree do require tillage. I think foxtail barley is one that we have a, a, a love-hate relationship with where tillage really can help. Um, timing is everything. When you talk some annual weeds, something like a rod weeder, we can do a great job of cleaning things up. You know that it's, but um, that's almost talking mold board plow type uh, era. So we're back into not turn of the century, but somewhere around there, I don't know. And then wild oats, I mean, just when they come up, it, it all depends on whether you're going to actually get the first flush, the second flush, the third flush, the 500th flush of those similar to kosha. So um, maybe Mike, you want to go through the energy costs of yeah. This is fascinating. It's fine so print. Is... You <laughs> yeah. better fascinating. have you better have better is... eyes than I do. I'm going to yeah. squint. Fascinating is code for what a confusing uh, chart. But uh, uh, I mean, st straight from Guy Coleman's manuscript. It's, I mean, the blue is mechanical weed control. So the the axis is energy consumption. Uh, the blue is uh, mechanical weed control. The red is thermal weed control. The yellow is is mulch. And then the green in the middle is kind of herbicide. So, you know, if you look at a lot of the, the tillage implements, they're either equivalent to or, or less than herbicide in terms of energy used, either manufacture the herbicide or to do the task of tillage. And a lot of these kind of uh, newer options, you know, uh, newer and quote options that require more energy. I mean, they're, they're yeah, tillage are, are very efficient, right? And so... I, I don't want to belabor the point too much. Like I, I get it. People are, are usually in a tillage system that works for their operation. I think, you know, that's why I go back to if you have a specific threat that requires something more drastic, that's worth considering. Um, otherwise, to me, the, the, the fine tuning of tillage in an operation is perhaps like with soil applied herbicides. Uh, you know, there's good evidence to show that that a little bit of incorporation improves a lot of so certain soil applied herbicides. It can have the adverse effect for others. But those are like little things that you can experiment with on your own operation. You know, a couple of passes through to incorporate a herbicide just to, to have the, the two comparisons to either scale up if it's successful or throw it in the trash can if it, it yields no results. Right. So that's mm -hmm. that's you know, we, again, we talk about multiple modes of action. How do you integrate it? I think kind of the low hanging fruit would be, are you a user of soil applied herbicides? Are there some of those things like Tammy mentioned, like the old harrows or tine weeders that could, could give you a little bit of incorporation to mitigate against poor precipitation after application and maybe give you a bump in weed control because, you know, the, the data is pretty clear on on certain soil applied herbicides, they, they work better if they're incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, also, everyone loves seeing videos of the rotary hoe and how fast you get to drive. So if little tiny thread stage um, annuals are the, your biggest threat, have at her and drive super fast. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's the, I don't know, I feel, um, so Ray has taken issue with turn of the century talk with the mobile or plow, um, something about age. But I, I have to tell you, being from Tammy's neck of the woods, I, I don't think I'd ever seen a plow at work. And and then I come here and it's really common. Like I know, and Mike and Peter, you can probably tell me it's way less than it used to or whatever, but I sort of feel like it's still, at least around here, I'm in Kimburn, there's still lots of plowing that happens. And I don't know if they're trying to keep people busy. I don't know if just no one's told them how much it costs or that there are other tools, but it it's a tough one to let go of because I'm pretty sure they don't have dandelion like I do, Mike. So Right. Well, let's like, Jason, if you could throw up slide or, or page five for me for a sec, that would be, and we can get rid of that uh, monstrosity. I mean, this is light texture soil. This is by all accounts, very small seedling flea bane. 
Um, this is, by all accounts, a fairly aggressive vertical tillage tool. And, and you can see there clearly in the photo, there's a little cluster with, you know, the amount of, of roots that those small seedling fleabane have to keep hold of soil, those things will survive. And so a moldboard plow would invert that and, and you wouldn't have that problem. So that is, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why people use uh, plowing, but, uh, you know, if we just focus on weed control, like there, there is a, a good user case for why that tool is a very good alternative to to herbicides and I, I guess i'm more interested in going in the direction of like are there like are there different types of plows that are maybe used in europe they're called mm. eco mat plows that are, are shallow plows that don't turn over six eight inches of soil that are turning over three four inches of soil i mean that's that's a more interesting conversation to have from my perspective mm -hmm. um yeah um yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that is a good place to just quickly pause a bit. I'm going to go to uh, our first clip. So we are going to talk, we've got a short clip here on exactly that on tillage as I think it's clip two, Jay, and then we'll go to a read for our uh, tonight's show sponsors. But we've got a bit of a comparison here on the weed control uh, using tillage with Rob Miller from BASF. <laughs> A lot of talk about tillage this winter and uh, you know we will also have to think about chemistry and you've got a really neat plot here and how these two can work together. Tell me what you got. Yeah definitely so this is very interesting. This is a was soybeans last year. We did one pass with the disc last fall after harvest and this spring we've already, already come in here with a cultivator and one pass and then planted the crop and what can we learn from some of that you know that tillage that's already happened. When we think back to last fall you know, it was really wide open fall. It was really warm and wet. And a lot of that tillage that happened last fall occurred later in the season. A lot of it even occurred later in December. And at that time of year, the ground was partially frozen. So it seemed to come up in clumps. And since the, it was really wide open, those weeds, those perennial weeds, those winter annual weeds just came up in clumps and never really had the, uh, the, the cultivator implement or the, the tillage implement cut those, those weeds. But what can we actually learn about the spring pass already? And when we look down at some of these weed species, you know, it's, it's really large. Uh, this one is actually annual bluegrass. So one pass with a the, with the cultivator already this spring, about a week ago, we've had an inch of rain or about three quarters of an inch of rain since that time of application. And that tillage pass just kind of uprooted it, but it's already sitting there with that inch of rain. It's just going to reroot itself and continue to uh, to, to grow. Even when we look at this bluegrass here, annual bluegrass spreading across the province, it's already starting to reroot itself with that recent moisture. So that's where tillage can be effective at controlling certain weeds, some of the perennial weeds, but for the most part, it's sometimes just covers up these weed species and making them more, more of a challenge to control. So that's where it's really important to get out there and time that, uh, you know, that tillage implement, but understand your weed pressure. It's not only annual bluegrass as well, but it's a weed like uh, dandelions. We're seeing a lot more of that this year. And as we move into dandelions here, I'm just gonna dig this one up. You can start to see that it's already started to, it's covered it up, it's almost like an iceberg. And then that, uh, that top root, it is cut off, but it's not 100% uh, controlled. And we're starting to see it even reroot itself after that recent moisture. And here's another one example here of some shepherd's purse, as well as some dandelion. Just kind of, it's been, it's been covered up, but you get that nice large root system. And this is the one that I'm going to be a little bit more concerned about because it's not very much top growth that's there. It's a lot of it's covered up, but the root growth underneath is very large. So a couple of the main take home messages, you know, tillage can be a very effective in terms of uh, soil preparation, but also have a plan in place to control some of these larger weeds. In a situation like this, you want to make sure that you control these weeds prior to the crop emerging. <laughs> Our sponsors are Adama Canada, Profitable Practices, and The Sharp Edge. The Sharp Edge on realagriculture.com looks to farmers, agronomists, and researchers to give leading info on everything from agronomic problem solving to increasing profitability. The Sharp Edge is made possible by support from Mazex. Learn more at realagriculture.com.
Sorry, I just, I really like the tunes. Um, okay, a few things there. Um, so we do have, for anyone who's been uh, checking out any of our schools, we, in the corn school, the soybean school, uh, weed school as well, we've been tackling some of the, the weed pressure. So check those out. We've got some of those. Um, I have a question. In looking at what Rob was showing, um, in exactly that, some of that, you know, some of the weeds, yes, the roots have been cut maybe not all the way but they're flipped over they're covered in soil whatever so then my question is in that scenario mike is that happening and then we're not going to spray until after the crop is up because in my mind if we're going to spray in that situation we're not actually getting any contact with these like we're worse off than if we had just waited and not tilled yeah, it's, it's a wasted pass most likely right uh, in a perfect yeah. world right you, you'd have like if the approach was, uh, I'm going to use chemical control to knock down the perennials, then then the idea would be to do that before the tillage in a perfect world, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But in a situation like that, and it happens, um, yeah, you'd want to see some positive green growth. Otherwise, yeah, it's it's largely going to be an ineffective application. Okay. Um, John Hurd has sent some wisdom to us. And Margaret May, it's true, we all love him. So don't, don't worry. And John, please come on the agronomist, even though you're retired. Uh, I'll just slide that one in there. Uh, plow, plows down snow. That's bad weeds for seven years. They said last century, he said. So, so 1999, is that what he's referring to? <laughs> or 1899? Yeah. Anyway. You know what, with John, we don't know. Uh, right. But we do have a question just to come back to wild oats for a moment there. So Tammy, if um, when we, if we want to avoid tillage in something like a wild oat situation or resistant wild oats, where are we at with managing resistant wild oats uh, as far as what our options are? Are we getting ahead of this particular one or are we still really struggling? I think that depends on who you talk to. Um, that's a fairly vague answer. Um, so I personally think that we have a number of tools that are pretty decent. Tillage can be one of them, especially if you delay your seeding and do that tillage early on, you can definitely get rid of a wild oats. That is absolutely helpful. That being said, there are lots of other things that we can do to make sure that we are managing our wild oat patches. The great thing about wild oats is they suck at dispersal, right? They don't tumble. They don't fly around in the egg flea bane. They do nothing. They just sit where they're at. So unless you spread them around, they're not going to move that far. So you can do some patch management. Uh, one of my favorites is silage. Uh, it's not sexy to a lot of grain farmers, but I have to say that this is one weed where if you wait until later in the season and chop its head off, it will not do well at reproducing and you um, are incredibly successful at uh, reducing the fecundity of that particular weed. And I say that on purpose because John Hurd hates that word. So I have said it on purpose for him. You are welcome, John Hurd. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm writing it down. Uh, okay, so silage, seeding rates, seeding dates, uh, tillage can be an incorporation. Uh, we can look at doing some pre, uh, pre-plant incorporated or pre-plant herbicides that will help uh, to either suppress or actually control, depending on which one we're looking at. So we've got lots of ways that we can uh, help um, to ensure that we reduce that population um, for each year and hopefully someday uh, drill down that that seed bank. But it w that is a, a long-term strategy. There is no uh, simple answer to that one. And I think Mike's facing a few weeds that are similarly challenging with how we, how we work with them. I just think wild oats, the, the, the real limitation to it is it has no good dispersal mechanism. So if we can take advantage of that, we can really uh, set it back. If on the other hand, it's spread all across your field already, then uh, maybe a perennial forage is a nice thing to do for a few years. Oh, Tammy, I love uh, that. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Uh, well, I have, I have follow up questions for Tammy, because we, we have some wild oats in Ontario, oh, no. a lot in their regional nature. Um, but uh, Dr. Francois Tardif has done a, a fair amount of work looking at kind of the resistance issue and management. And so if, uh, our story is, you know, a lot of a lot of group one resistance and now starting to see also a lot of group two resistance. And and I guess is that similar in Manitoba? And so how effective are some of the soil applied herbicides? And, and do you have one or two that you think are worth looking at? 
uh, right Manitoba is a leader. No, Manitoba is a leader in wild oats. And a very, very little known fact would be um, a turn of the century ago. No, just a couple of decades ago, I studied multiple herbicide resistant wild oats for um, fun. Let's go with that. Um, so group one resistance in Manitoba is a, about 80% of the populations have some group one resistance in them. And then we're, we're inching up on group two resistance as well, uh, especially as we've transitioned from like amazimethabens or some of the older chemistries like assert that weren't super hot on wild oats and have gone into some of the group twos that are a little bit more strong in their selection pressure. So we see that the levels rising as far as group one and group two uh, combined resistance. There is also some group 15 resistance in some pockets as well, and that doesn't seem to disappear. There doesn't seem to be a fitness penalty there. So we use a group 15 later on, it, it still happens, the reclassified group eights, of course. Um, so are there a lot of soil applied? No, but there are still a couple that can be useful. So I know that um, maybe more suppression type of nature, but uh, group 15, and it's not our chemistry, so then I'm bad with names, but I think uh, Zidua, so pyroxysulfone, is that right, is, is one of them. Uh, we still have edge that will work. Um, the abidexes and fortresses of the world in, in a lot of areas work as well. So then if you start off uh, that weed in a weakened state and then get a good healthy crop com competition happening, uh, you tend to do decently well with in-crop because uh, the best um, surfactant, adjuvant, or whatever that I can add to make a herbicide work better is crop competition rather than anything mm -hmm. else. So um, if I can get that crop off to a better start, however that may be, then definitely uh, we see a better better job with that in-crop herbicide, even if it is only getting some of the wild oak population that's there, either the group ones or the group twos uh, are working. Does like that make sense, Mike? What did I miss? <laughs> no, I mean, our experience has been the soil applied herbicides are mediocre at best, but but uh, they're mm -hmm. better than, you know, herbicide that is ineffective, right? Uh, because of resistance. So fair enough. It's a struggle. Yeah. Um, John, and then the like crop, to cross resistance patterns. Oh, fecundity, F E yes. C U N D I T Y. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. Yes, we can, John. Okay. There and then, go. okay, carrying on. Cross resistance patterns within the group ones and group twos, with there being the three subgroups within the group ones, we have some complications there, and also some within the group twos. Um, Peter, uh, you and John should get together and find a dictionary <laughs> and spend some time looking up some of these words. Yes. So it's like prolificness or the ability to reproduce. So um, thank you for test your IQ today. I We love words. We love to learn on this show, Tammy. So you're helping us learn. Okay. So um, yeah. So Scott mentioned, so Tammy, you've mentioned as well in certain situations, and this has come up in other conversations about kosha or about saline patches or about those sorts of things, about introducing something like a perennial or something else that has a different growth pattern than what you've typically been dealing with. Um, and uh, so Scott says with the new SCAP funding, at least in Alberta, there is funding to convert annual to perennial cover uh, for the seed or seeding costs. So it's a good time to try. And so I will realistically, even without funding, if you've got the market near you, there may be fields that you can convert to perennial cover for a couple of years to try and get ahead of some of the really bad problems, especially where uh, herbicide resistance has become an issue. I, I do want to talk about on that topic, although I really want to talk about um, mixing trouble as well, but on the topic of crop competition, because I'm going to put it on a shirt. Um, Mike, you've got a great slide. I think it's your very last one that looks at rise impact on reducing biomass of fleabane. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we'll go through, a, maybe we'll go through a few uh, slides. So yeah. let's start with okay. slide Which 12. Which one do you want to start with? Okay. Let's start with slide 12. Because, um, and I recognize that uh, the window is narrow, but this, this field here uh, was planted this past December, like after corn harvest um to cereal rye and and even if that's a tight window for us after corn in ontario i mean there's still plenty of acres that come out of soybeans and don't go into winter wheat right and so um that was taken a week ago it's even better now stops erosion 
uh, doesn't take a lot. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, in the past trials, we've noticed like, you know, you see weird things like this, where you swear that I, I or someone went to the left of that rye with a, a little banded spray nozzle and put down some soil applied herbicide, but that's, that's the allelopathic effect of rye. And so if you go to the next slide, um, we, you know, the papers published by Ted Van Hy, you know, there was a significant reduction year to year, like of all the things we've discussed today, like aside from herbicide, like tillage actually didn't have a significant effect on reducing flea bane biomass in a study that was done in Ontario by Francois and Clarence uh, Swanton and uh, Ted. But what was was cereal rye. And you can see in this picture, like as you get further away from the cereal rye, you get taller flea bane. So the allelopathy of the exuded from the roots um, and of the senescing leaves of rye um, exude a chemical, and I'll just use the abbreviation, which is BOA. And it acts like somewhat of a soil applied herbicide that either um, inhibits germination or at least reduces plant biomass. So um, the next slide is just kind of a, a proxy. Um, so slide 15. Um, no, let's go to slide 16. 16 I apologize. I think, yeah. yeah, there it's we okay. go. So, I mean, we use lettuce because it's more visual to see than flea bean. Flea bean is kind of tough to visualize, but, you know, these are three Petri dishes on the far left. Uh, um, the medium has no BOA, and then it's impregnated in the middle with one micromole of uh, BOA, and then on the left or the far right, a higher rate. And you can see it has, you know, basically herbicidal property on certain species. And so, um, you know, that's, again, it, it's kind of a, a poor, mediocre at best soil applied herbicide, but it is kind of similar to Tammy's discussion on wild oats. It's chipping away a little bit at the population, making it smaller, making it easier that when you go in there with a herbicide or tillage, um, you're not dealing with as a severe situation. Um, and so, yeah, Peter asked the question about like, you know, how big does Ryan need to be to generate BOA? And so there's kind of two things that, um, well, there's three things that affect BOA production. I, I assume there's some cultivar differences, but we just don't have that intelligence. Mm -hmm. Um, and fr frankly, in Ontario, there's one cultivar of, of rye grown, so who cares? But, um, it generally, it's around kind of um, stem elongation is when um, it's released the most, but it also gets released under stressful conditions. That's why typically it works better in environments that are more stressed or more moisture stressed. Um, so that's why it, there's a couple of reasons why it works better in sandier ground. One, it's more stressful, probably more BOA production, and two, um, more available for uptake by the species you want to get rid of. Tammy, you but. have a follow-up question. Put them on the hot seat. Well, I have many. Well, I have many of them. They're similar to what you just touched on, but my my understanding or my impression is that certainly we see more uh, allelopathic effects from fall rye as it's um, degrading, or like you talked about senescence of the leaves. So my mm -hmm. understanding was that that's when we saw more of the exudate happening. And I am then also wondering what does one NM of My micro BOA, mole. Yes. Micro mole. Sorry. It's, it's a little weird you, I think usually, but it anyway, is. micro mole. Uh, yeah. uh, what does that look like? How big of a plant or how much rye do you need yeah. to make a micro mole of BOA? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, and so those numbers would have been taken from what typically other studies have found are exuded. So it's kind of within, I think the, the one value is within kind of a reasonable range. And then like, and then five is more of a, to look at it. I think there was initially a dose response done. And then, and then that, what you saw on the slide is kind of the extreme of that. So kind of, I, you know, off the cuff, I think it's in around that one, which is kind of what you can see, like in a best case scenario. And mm -hmm. so, you know, of course it's going to range and, and, you know, it doesn't also have to be cereal, right? Like I like the idea of also, like it's more kind of winter cover. 
And so, yeah, yeah, rye has a little pathy and whether we get a lot or a little little pathy, probably there's not a whole lot we can do to, to manipulate that. We're a little bit at the mercy of our environment. Um, but things like triticale um, interest me because they put on a lot of cover quickly in the fall. They're also a very good source of forage. And mm-hmm. so, you know, if you could harvest that early the next spring, plant soybeans into that after, like, like those are the things to me that are a- appealing and worth investigating in terms of keeping the ground cover, keep, reducing recruitment of these weeds and driving down mm-hmm. populations so that if we do have failures, which we're going to have, that they're not as dramatic and that they're more manageable. I, w- I just want to point out that uh, so triticale, which is a cross between rye and wheat, was developed at the University of Manitoba. Um, so there you go. You're welcome, everyone. Manitoba also made canola, so rocking it. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> anyway, okay. So, but this is a really, so one of the key things, and I think there's, there is a, a slide, but we don't have to go to it, but in, I think it was 2018, one of those years, Mike, there is a slide that shows that the rye reduced the flea bane biomass by 88%. And in, yep. so we just, we just did a, a wheat school not long ago about how, cultural practices can be as effective as essentially a mode of action Mm -hmm. so in in the thinking of if we know obviously our herbicides are we want them to be above 90 above 95 but like we want you know the best control or we expect the best control but if i applied a product that got me 88 percent, i'd probably still be pretty happy so if i think about it from those that way if using that fall cover can reduce, especially if flea bane is one of my biggest issues in my soybeans or whatever, like that to me then becomes a really effective sort of mode of action if it can get that 80% reduction. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to oversell that data because that was a reduction in biomass. And so there was actually very little reduction in population. And and at the end of the day, I'd rather have no plants than reducing, but to, you know, if we think about a smaller flea bane plant, it's easier to kill regardless of how we want to approach that. So that, that has value. Um, yeah. And I'm also like with, with rye, I think if we keep our expectations low, we won't be disappointed. And, uh, and that's how I would like to, because it's not a panacea, right? But no. it is, uh, it is a good tool. Okay. We don't have any of those. Tammy is laughing for some reason. I don't know why. We need to go to we need to go to our last sponsor read. Uh, thank you, producer Jay, for reminding me. Hello to Jose, who's joining us from Arizona. He's got some cool questions in the comments. Um, and to Alan, who's joining us out of Winnipeg. And uh, hello to Paisley. And okay, Jay, if we can go to our last sponsor read, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about antagonism in the tank. Our sponsors for The Agronomists are Adama Canada, The Sharp Edge, and Profitable Practices. Profitable Practices on realagriculture.com is a video series featuring Canadian producers who are adopting farm practices that have a positive impact on profit, people, and the planet. Profitable Practices is made possible by support from Farm Credit Canada and RBC Royal Bank. Learn more at realagriculture.com slash profitable dash practices. I, you know, you guys should just realize that I'm always dancing whenever there's music on. So anyway, okay, so um, yes, there's someone crawling under Tammy's desk. It's just her. It's fine. I also just said that my chair is actually missing a leg right now because it fell off. I didn't have time to put it back on. Uh, so you know what? It's me. Everything's great. Uh, and uh, okay, so I want to talk about quickly uh, with the time that we have left. I do want to talk about ta- tank mixes, but I also want to talk about the value of a pre-seed burn down. And then Jason's got some great questions about some stuff in Manitoba. But Mike, let's quickly chat about some of the most common mixing issues that we have uh, for early weed control. You mentioned it early in the show about, you know, often we are trying to shove as many things in the tank for efficiency's sake, but what issues could we potentially be running into uh, some of the most common ones? Yeah, so I'll start off by saying, like, uh, the first thing we should be doing when we're tank mixing is just, you know, you do a scan of all the labels because if, if there's any exclusionary statements, um, and by that I mean like a product says specifically do not mix with anything other than what's on this label, then that's a no-fly zone. And then also if a label says nothing, it makes no guidance around tank mixing, 
uh, that's a no-fly zone either. So that's you know a quick scan, and then ult ultimately the issues that I've seen around mixing is is usually order of operation, which okay. can again be uh, facilitated by the label because they usually will tell you the mixing order. And then secondly, uh, more recently, getting into trouble when you're mixing fertilizers in a weed and feed scenario, and there might be less guidance on there. And so you talk to the manufacturer or not, but I guess the thing I'd like to highlight for the group is, is generally speaking, um, uh, the majority of issues I've seen mixing herbicides with fertilizers revolve around like ammonium thiosulfate or ATS. And so if Jason throws up slide one, next three slides, they're just ex diff different examples of, of where it's been a ch challenge mixing things. So on the left-hand side, like this is both, um, uh, you know, dual two magnum being mixed in the tank on the left side is with ammonium thiosulfate. And you see how it's basically separated out, like the, the product has separated out and staying on the surface. Whereas on the right hand side, that's how the, the herbicide should go in solution. So clearly, like when you have layers like that, you can imagine the rate at which that brown goop goes out like that, that would be pretty significant in terms of of just messing up the rate and, and crop injury. And if we go to slide two, um, you know, you learn things when you're doing small plot spraying. So this is me trying to mix ammonium thiosulfate in Liberty. And I got, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, particles that had ended up, you know, not you know, would plug nozzles and, and things of that nature. And then the it's third pretty slide, though, Mike. it is pretty, I mean, it's pretty. So I'll give you that. It's a, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice awesome. color. Yeah. And if it's 250 milliliters at a time, it's pretty easy to clean up. But uh, then the, the last one, you know, this is a demo that Jason DeVoe and I did um, quite a bit, maybe four years ago. And it's just, you know, different ratios of ammonium thiosulfate to UAN. So like this is a, you know, a corn herbicide scenario where you're wanting to add a little sulfur fertilizer to the um, urea ammonium nitrate. And when it's, there's a relatively high rate of, of ATS relative to UAN, which is on the far left-hand side, you get a lot of separation and like kind of the product just turns into a gloopy mass. Um, if you lower that ratio of, of ATS to UAN, it mixes better. Or you can keep the same ratios of UAN and ATS uh, with the third option. You just your order of operation matters, right? And so if we put in UAN first, then mix the herbicide with it and then add ATS last, um, then we seem to have a mixable solution. So this is, you know, this is stuff that you might not find on the label. You'd have to either phone the manufacturer to see if they have any guidance mm -hmm. around it, or realistically in this case, um, you do a jar test to figure it out. Um, so, you know, that's the type of antagonism like I think the video deals with antagonism in terms of like products, you know, reducing efficacy based on, you know, competing yeah. for possibly a site of action. This is the one that's probably more uh, messy and annoying is the compatibility side that, that um, is horrible. I don't like it. And I'm only dealing with very small volumes of yeah. product and, and small booms. Right. Yeah. Imagine if it's the whole sprayer. So, but that is a really good point, right? There's two sort of things to think about. There's the effectiveness. So what impact certain tank mixes may have on either making something too hot or bringing something down. But then there's also this, which is a great example of the mess that can happen even before it gets in the field. Um, so definitely both things to consider. Uh, there's some great chat that uh, Francois I'll get to in a moment. Tammy, I want to touch on pre-seed burnoff is it worth it? Um, because it's one of those things, especially when let's say time gets tight. So let's say it's a late start or, you know, the conditions aren't great. There's always that question of, do I just get the crop in and then spray or is it worth the pre-seed burnoff? And that's always a judgment call. So what do we have for some of the guidance on whether that pre-seed burnoff pays? So if uh, Jay wants to bring up slide one, that's a good example. And we have lots of uh, older material um, from the 80s and the 90s that helps us to know that a weed that emerges before a crop is much more competitive uh, and has a much more detrimental impact on that on that crop. But there's a couple of other things. So yeah, yes, it pays off, but 
one, because of the critical weed free period, but two, just the ability to control the weeds. So this is actually canola. And then that larger sort of grassy looking weed in there is actually narrow leafed hawksbeard that has gone from the rosette stage and is now getting ready to bloom. And at this point in time, utilizing even a rela glyphosate starts to become kind of iffy as to whether it's going to work or not. So um, just being able to control the weeds and um, the impact on stand establishment, uh, as well as your yield potential. And, and I know that there has been tons of work done by Peter Sikma as far as the impact of weeds on soybeans and corn. So I know we all know uh, whether it's wheat or canola that getting those weeds gone and having that better stand establishment and having that critical weed free period actually weed free does pay off in the end we can have a very clean field at the end of the year but if we waited to remove those weeds until the end of the year we'll have way less yield than if we remove them earlier on so if we go to the next slide for a second this is uh this is a little bit more fun i do occasionally dabble with trying to do research as well, uh, not, not quite to the same level as Mike or Francois or many others. But uh, if we're looking at three days before uh, seeding, as far as getting a pre-seed um, of any type of herbicide, side in. Typically what we're looking at is controlling perennials. In this case, you can see that with the pre-seed that I was utilizing, it worked very quickly, very effectively. This had been after a tillage and delayed seeding. And so there was lots of lovely annual weeds that died quite conveniently for me three days before. If we have that significant amount of annual weeds, um, we're probably going to want to creep closer to just before planting uh, in order to maximize how much of that weed free period we get with that stand establishment. So the one day before, if you look really closely at the back of that red line, you can see that even the one day before is already having an impact on those annual weeds as compared to the unsprayed. I took it a step farther and I did a, a, a spray application after I seeded. And then you get into sort of this impact where you hurt the weeds and they're no longer actively taking up the herbicide. And so you get really poor control of the weeds. Mm. And so I learned a painful lesson that you chase the, uh, you chase the sprayer rather than the uh, sprayer chasing the seeder because you get a better return on investment investment if you use those weeds beforehand when you're looking at a herbicide that doesn't have extended control. If you've got some flushing control, if you're looking at something that's got some residual, then all of this gets thrown out the door and you have a different set of rules to play with. So it depends what there you're you using. I like, I, so, but this is telling though, that just even that three days, so I like that idea. So chase the sprayer, mm -hmm. don't, not the other way around. Um, uh, thank you to Francois Tardif in the comments. He has, everyone wanted to know what BOA actually stood for. So we have it there. I'm not even going to try and say it, Mike, maybe you want to, uh, but, but Tammy has a follow-up question for you, Mike. And there's a few more on the UAN ATS uh, mixing and I, I share Tammy's same question. So why is it that ATS causes such an issue? Is it like, what, is it acidic? Is it like, what is the chemical reason that it's such a pain? Yeah, I don't know is the uh, short answer. Okay. Um, I don't yeah, either. I'll, yeah, I'm not going to BS on that. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know either. Do, to address some of the questions in there, like I should have done a better job of, of explaining it. Like we had ma ma magnetic stirrers in each one of those um, okay. um, glass jars that were stirring the solution as we were mixing it. So like there was quite a bit of agitation as all the components were put together. And okay. then like after agitation was done, um, you know, they, they would, you know, in the case of the high ratios of a ATS, it would separate out quite quite quickly after you stopped agitating, whereas the other ones tended to stay in solution better in the absence of agitation. So yeah, agitation is helpful, um, but um, you know, if you're fighting against that, like if you need that constant agitation to keep it in a reasonable solution, yeah. that's problematic. Yeah, okay, that's, well, so that's a really neat point though. So these were each, agitated like as you were mixed and then they were yep. left so that does explain um okay so that's yep. interesting okay very cool um and anyone who wants to give the boa a try you can I have mean, that or <laughs> that's why we call it boa so that's why we that's do why. there's lots of it's also why i call lambda psi lambda psi 
because the cyhalothrin is, it's a bit of a, the TH in there really throws me off. So I don't say it. Um, but uh, for anyone who wasn't, uh, who's not on YouTube in the comments, uh, there was discussion. So uh, Francois Tardif did explain, uh, to reiterate Mike's point, that the BOA is essentially most concentrated when the rye is small, but because there's more of it when the plant is bigger or there are more plants. So it's not a perfect sort of uh, kind of thing. And it's, as he said, and as you said, Mike, it's impacted by stress and all sorts of other factors. So there isn't necessarily a perfect, you must have this many plants per square meter and they must be this tall for you to get an impact. So um, this is where I will throw out, hey, try something out and let us know how it worked. That's where I'll throw that out. <laughs> How's that sound? Um, there you go. Uh, very quickly, we have a couple minutes left. So if anyone's got any last questions, please throw them in. Uh, but I did want to just touch on water volume very quickly. So when we are talking about control, when we are talking about the most, uh, we could probably do a whole show just on water and do you treat water? What do you do in the tank? Uh, but let's just, if we can touch on water volume, um, it seems to be one of those ones that at times we try to get away with lower volumes. Um, what impact does it have? Mike, I'll start with you. Can yeah. I lower water volumes or no? Yeah, for certain products, you can lower water volumes like, uh, and mainly systemic products like glyphosate is the most obvious example of a product where you can err on going lower. Um, and what's lower, I don't, you know, it depends where you go. Like here's, you know, let's say 10 gallons, you know, down to five gallons, sure. Um, but, um, you know, where you don't want to cheat on water volumes is with the contact herbicides because that's a coverage issue. And I mean, there's plenty of good data to show that more water is better. So 20 gallons per acre is better than 10 gallons per acre and 15 is better than 10, you know, like, so the, you know, ideally 20 gallons per acre, but if you can be 15 versus 10, you know, all the better. So I think for me, like, so, um, you know, Jason asked about like issues in Manitoba, you know, one of our issues in Ontario that's just popped up is like group 14. So reflex blazer resistant common ragweed. And so our options are pretty limited if you're an IP soybean grower or a dry bean grower to, to deal with common ragweed. So you're, you're basically left with things like Bazagran, which aren't really great on ragweed to begin with and, and our contact herbicides. And so there's a situation where you would not be doing yourself any favors by cutting water volumes. Um, you know, you, you need that coverage, but there's other products where you can get away with it. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the long and short of it. Now, Tammy, I'm sure you have thoughts to add. And also, this is where we can have the conversation of should we in the West be fearing fleabane? But we'll start with water volume and then we'll get to Jason's question about fleabane. Well, I agree with Mike that it really depends on what kind of chemistry you're using or if you're using some systemic and uh, some contacts together, then, uh, you know, you need to weigh out the advantages and disadvantages and being faster versus not killing the weeds. I'd rather kill weeds every day than, uh, than not um, and, and save half an hour. That being said, I think in addition to water volume, you have to talk about how you're getting that coverage. If you're going, you know, an ultra coarse droplet and you're only hitting, you know, a drop here and there versus really good coverage with a coarse or even a large droplet size, then you're probably going to do a better job depending on what your weeds are. So it it becomes this hot, crazy matrix of what are you, you know, what are you looking at? What's your water volume? What's your water quality? Uh, yeah, I know. Where's the unicorn in the, the spray solution uh, <laughs> side of things? Um, and so it just doesn't, it, it's not just the factor of water volume, but it's also all the weeds that you're using, what your coverage is going to be like, what the herbicides are that you're utilizing. It gets way more complicated. Uh, more is always better. Uh, in my opinion, but uh, I think it becomes j just a few more factors than just that water volume alone. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about... Did I make it too Jake complicated, Mike? No. I like it. Nope. I like the hot, the hot, crazy <laughs> matrix. Um, so Jason asked a great question that just before we went live, this was what we were talking about, is that the West really struggles with kosha. We've got multiple resistance. It spreads. It's really bad. Then in Ontario, we've got fleabane. 
it spreads. It's really bad. It's everywhere. Um, they both have similarities. They all have differences. But the question of flea rain doesn't seem to, at least at this point, thrive in the West and Kosha doesn't seem to thrive in the East. So, Tammy, I guess from your perspective, we, in Manitoba, there has been water hemp. And you want Mike to take yes. back all his gross weeds or keep them. So do we need to worry about fleabane in Manitoba and Points West? Well, so we're starting to see a few more pockets of fleabane where it's starting to be a little bit more of a consistent problem. We've always kind of had it in Carmen. Like we've always been able to put it at, say, crop diagnostic school with uh, Manitoba agriculture has demonstrated it. Like Bruce Murray talked about it and Bruce, and there's a few of you that know him on here, know that he's been around for a day or two as well. So not new to the area. It's just that we're seeing a little bit more of it. I just expected that we would have seen more and more of it a because it's more. a prolific yeah. seed producer. We can go back to fecundity if you want to, right? So um, we've got that with it. And it just, it's curious what the adaptation is, why, why we can't, uh, or why we don't have it. And I'm happy with that. I would like it if the water hemp went away as well, but uh, right. water, again, I don't think we're going yeah. anywhere. No. So Mike. So Mike, can can you tell yeah. me why? Uh, no, I can speculate, right? Because, yeah, I mean, does anyone really know? Maybe Francois knows. I, I guess here's what I'd be interested in, Tammy. Like, from the literature, uh, we know that, you know, fleabane seed needs a certain temperature to germinate. It's usually above 15 degrees Celsius. And I've seen where like, um, you know, depending on when it germinates in the season, if it doesn't make it um, quite to flowering prior to the first frost, like it's pretty frost sensitive when it's flowering, then that plant doesn't finish off its life cycle. So I just wonder whether there's something, you know, like, cause there's records of it in Manitoba, as you mentioned for quite some time, like the like biology of Canadian weeds has a fair bit of it on the old Canada map. I wonder whether there's just something about the, the life cycle that isn't really maximizing seed production at this point. And eventually it'll, it'll adapt and to where it maybe will germinate. In, like, I'm just totally speculating, but that would be, there's, there's gotta be something inhibiting massive seed produ yeah. production. And I feel like Mike, that again, this is yeah. a cold joke. This is, you went the typical, it's Manitoba. Yeah. You went, went lazy. straight for the cold joke. It was lazy. I'll be honest. I expected yeah. better. It was a hack move. Yes. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so well, there you go. Two things, and I agree with I I agree with Peter here. Why isn't Kosha a bigger problem in Ontario? Um, right. Because I mean, are you not salty enough? We're too salty. You're not. Is mm. that where this is well. at? I I don't get it. Yep. Shush. Uh, <laughs> Um, but the other thing on the, the flea bane is if we can grow water hemp and do a fairly good job of it, then I just thought we should be able to do a really good job of flea bane then, but mm -hmm. not similar enough. Yeah. I uh, like, yeah. Uh, I don't know is the unsatisfying answer to we your question. Them. This is good. I so. like it. I love it. Yeah. No, makes yeah. me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, one of the reasons that's helped us out, I think for Kosha here is as I'm, as we talked off camera before, like I've only ever seen it uh, really pop up in uh, new seeded forage fields. And so there inherently you're cutting it and maybe never letting it really get to, to flower, produce much seed or, I don't know, that would be, or there's probably something about the soil that's maybe not as hospitable. We've certainly seen it, but it just hasn't ever really stuck around in those field environments where we found it. Hmm. So, okay, so Manitoba is too cold, but better soil. And yes, that's what I'm going with. Okay, so sure. Ontario, yeah, Kosha needs good soil, and it's like, mm, sorry, Ontario, not gonna hack it. Okay, so there you go. That's that's what we're gonna go with. Um, I don't think it's accurate, but it's this is how we learn things: is we have these conversations, and then somebody is like, I do know about this, or someone has a bright idea and does the research. So if anybody got a bright idea, um, and yes, Ray, did a pop-up at new seeded forage fields? Yes. A lot of alfalfa, especially alfalfa seed production is done in Western Canada, a lot of it in Manitoba, actually. And, uh, and so, yes, you do bring in 
uh, some happy little seeds with your alfalfa seeds um, that are pollinated by leaf cutter bees, by the way, just so everybody knows. That's what those, if everyone has driven through Manitoba and sees those like little huts out in the field, those are the bees, the leaf cutter bees, and they are put there, their hives are in there so that they will pollinate the alfalfa fields to make seed. Ta-da! There you go. Um, okay, so yes, we have we have also had many discussions about where some of these weeds have come from, whether they come on equipment or in seed or all sorts of different things. Um, and so ultimately, just keep your weeds to yourself, everybody. That's my message for tonight. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> anyway, okay, we got to wrap this up. Mike, thank you so much for joining me. Yep, not a problem. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Tammy. Bringing up the hot, crazy matrix in weed control is a skill, and you have it. So thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure that's yeah. what that is, but and <laughs> yes, don't forget the ducks. Francois is right. Don't forget the You're ducks. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. The ducks also bring the weeds. We must blame the ducks. Okay. Thank you everyone who's been here in the, uh, in the comments joining us tonight live. You can head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. Let us know you watch the show, get those CEU credits. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Next week we'll be back. We're going to talk uh, soybean fertility, I think. And the week after that, we're going to talk about root rot. So see you again next Monday. Thank you to our show sponsors, to Adama Canada, to Profitable Practices and the Sharp Edge. Thank you, Mike and Tammy. Cheers, everybody.